Hello and welcome to iDesh Gaming. Well, it's time to review the third Modern Warfare game, and you know what they say about the third part of a trilogy, they're always the worst. But why? Well, it's usually a couple of factors. In some situations it's obvious there was never originally meant to be three movies, but success from the first two made the studios push for a third in order to make more money. That's how you end up with movies like Matrix Revolution, Spider-Man 3, and Battle of the Five Armies. In other scenarios, such as Star Wars and Christopher Nolan's Batman trilogy, the story is clearly meant to be told in three parts, but the first two were just so successful that the third really had no hope of ever measuring up. But those are all examples of movie trilogies, which leads me to ask, does the same hold true for video games? Well, to be honest, we haven't really seen that many trilogies in gaming. Don't get me wrong, we've seen several series of games with at least three installments, but a lot of them don't tell a continuing story all the way through. The Halo series told a complete story through three games, and the third is seen as the lesser, but nowhere near a bad game, and the same is true for Assassin's Creed's Ezio trilogy. The third game in the Batman Arkham series is widely considered the weakest one. Heck, even with Call of Duty, Treyarch's Black Ops series saw worse reviews with their third release as compared to the first two. Since this is the third part of our trilogy of reviews, I guarantee that this video will follow the time-honored tradition of being awful. This is Modern Warfare 3! The game starts shortly after the second game ends, with Nikolai and Captain Price, again voiced by Billy Murray, trying to get Soap to a doctor while Soap has flashbacks to the first two games. We then cut to New York as the Russian invasion of America continues. In this level, a four-man Delta Force team is trying to destroy a Russian jamming tower at the top of the New York Stock Exchange. Here we play as Frost, accompanied by his squad mate Sandman, voiced by William Fitchner, Grinch, voiced by Timony Oliphant, and Truck, voiced by Idris Elba. So your squad includes the Shredder, Raylan Givens, and... Look at me! I'm Black Superman! How is this war still going on? After destroying the jammer, the team then hijacks a Russian submarine and uses its missiles to destroy and push back the Russian Navy, causing the Russians to pull their troops out of America. We cut back to Price in the game as they come under attack with Soap still on the operating table. What is that? Here we play as Yuri, voiced by Brian Bloom, a Russian loyalist who hates Makarov just as much as Price does. The group fights their way out with the help of a UGV. After escaping, Price delivers some dialogue that is trying so hard to be philosophical and deep that I swear Christopher Nolan himself must have written it. They say truth is the first casualty of war. But who defines what's true? The Russian president is flying to Hamburg to negotiate a peace treaty with NATO delegates. Truth? It's just a matter of perspective. However, many Russians still blame America for the massacre at Sakaev Airport. The duty of every soldier is to protect the innocent, and sometimes that means preserving the lie of good and evil. That war isn't just natural selection played out on a grand scale. But for now, it looks like the world may finally know peace. The only truth I've found is that the world we live in is a giant tinderbox. All it takes is someone to light the match. It is important to note here that the first two games were both written by the same person, Jesse Stern, who was also a writer for NCIS, Titanfall 1 and 2, and Battlefield 4. However, this game was written by Paul Hagens, Academy Award winning writer of Crash and Casino Royale, as well as the co-creator of Walker Texas Ranger. You know what a Chuck Norris video game would be called? Immortal Kombat. Thank you, thank you, yes, yes, I'll show myself out for that. 
the change in writer does make this game's story feel less like a war-based video game and more of an action movie. I know I said the last game felt like it was straight out of Hollywood, but it still had the feeling of soldiers fighting a war. This game sometimes feels like your stereotypical action hero winning the war all by himself. As a result, a larger portion of the game's story is told through the cutscenes. Which, in Call of Duty games, let's be fair, players often either skip or use as a quick bathroom break. This isn't necessarily a bad change, but it could be an explanation for why fewer people remember most of the story from this game as compared to the first two. We skip ahead a couple of months as the Russian president is on his way to negotiate a peace treaty with the US. However, the plane comes under attack from ultra-nationalists. I think I know why the Russians lost this war. Their secret service agents fire their guns with one hand! What is this, Red Dead Redemption? The secret service secures the president and his daughter, but the plane crashes while attempting to land. The president's men find him and prepare to take him to safety. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. Could the Secret Service agents be any more useless in this scene? I mean, they have four guys there and not one of them even gets a shot off on the world's most wanted person. In his defense, Makarov did make it a fair fight. He used his powers of time manipulation to give them even more time to aim and fire. Makarov tells the Russian president that he wants his nuclear launch code so Russia can conquer Europe. When the president refuses, Makarov tells his men to find the missing daughter to use as leverage. Every man has his weakness. Find the girl. After the attack, Price, Soap, and Yuri go to Africa to intercept some shipments that Makarov is sending to European countries. Despite their best efforts, though, they miss the shipment and let it get away. Alright, lads, let's do this. Oh, don't worry, I'm sure they weren't important or anything. You got it? Are you recording? Okay, so this is day three, London, and we're off to... Sarah, tell Daddy where we're going. We're going to Big Ben. That's right, Big Ben. Oh, there it is, sweetie. It's right there. Honey, are you kidding this? <laughs> Look at me, Daddy! <laughs> So, I didn't mention that, like the second game, this one also comes with a graphic content warning, referring to this part of the game. Apparently, those shipments Makarov was running through Africa were chemical weapons, which he unleashes across Europe to prevent Russia from losing the war. I know a lot of people say that No Russian is the most disturbing mission in this series, but for me, it's this little scene. For one, No Russian had much less buildup to the massacre. We only had a couple of seconds between us stepping out of the elevator and people being mowed down. In this part, we have almost 40 seconds of buildup between when we first see this family and when they eventually get blown up. Also, while we saw more people killed in No Russian, the developers made sure to make the victims only adults. Here, 
we see an entire family, including a little girl, get freaking vaporized. For an invasion. Meanwhile, the Delta Squad from earlier is deployed to Hamburg to rescue a high-level hostage. Metal Zero One, this is Overlord Actual. You are being rerouted for Hamburg. We've got a principal-level hostage rescue. Who is it? The Vice President. Do the writers here just have some vendetta against Secret Service agents? By the way, does that VP look a little familiar to you? Please clap. Sandman and the group push through Hamburg and rescue the Vice President, while Price and his gang track the cargo freighter that delivered the bombs to Somalia and track down the warlord who runs the port. He gives them the name of Makarov's bomb maker, Volk, who oversaw the bombs in Paris. This is for the boys at Harrow. The team gets ready to leave, but are caught in a sandstorm, which knocks Nikolai's chopper out of the sky. Yuri rescues Nikolai and carries him to safety. Price's intel is relayed to the Delta Force as they are sent to Paris in the aftermath of the chemical attack. Be disturbed. They fight through the streets of Paris before crawling down into the catacombs. They find Volk down there, and a chase follows. They capture Volk and proceed to extract him with the help of an AC-130. While the first two games also had an AC-130 level, this is the best in the series. It sets itself apart by offering both the thermal view as well as full-color satellite imagery, giving it that extra sense of immersion. This is also the first of these levels that bounces back and forth between the eye in the sky and boots on the ground. The other gunship missions were also very slow and meandering. This level takes place during a chase scene, upping the suspense as you see and feel the entire city closing in on the group as they try and escape. The group ends up trapped on a bridge near the Eiffel Tower and hold off the enemies until air support arrives. So we're ripping off G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra now. Of all the action movies, why that one? Volk gives up that Makarov is hiding in Prague, and Price and the boys go to finish him off once and for all. After sneaking through a town that's been taken over by the Russians, Soap and Yuri set up in a clock tower to assassinate Makarov, eerily resembling Price and Macmillan's attempted assassination of Zakayev from the first game. This attempt goes about as well as that one does, as it turns out Makarov, again, was one step ahead of everyone. What the hell? Price, who is that? Kamarov. I'm sorry, Price. Captain Price. At Rzdjotibia. Price, get out of there! Sorry, my friend. You never should have come What the hell's here. he talking about? Get out now! <laughs> Yuri appears to be okay, but Soap is badly hurt, which is pretty odd considering they fell out of the same clock tower. That tower was pretty tall too, in reality they should both be dead already. Price and Yuri try to get Soap to safety, but it turns out to be in vain, as Soap utters his final words. Price takes this about how you would expect him to. So trusted you. I thought I could too. So why in bloody hell does Makarov know you? So we flash back to scenes from the first two games as Yuri explains how he used to be a member of Makarov's group of ultra-nationalists before trying to defect. Here, my 
It seems Yuri has bought himself some time. Okay, Yuri. You bought yourself some time. As Price remembers his friend Soap in what is definitely the most emotional moment of the game. There's a clock tower in Hereford where the names of the dead are inscribed. We try to honor their deeds, even as their faces fade from our memory. Those memories are all that's left when the bastards have taken everything else. What happened? He killed Soap. He's gone, Mac. Price and Yuri sneak into Makarov's castle in Prague and find that Makarov knows the location of the Russian president's daughter. Price and Yuri leave the castle in a blaze of glory and inform Sandman and his team that Makarov is close to finding the girl. The US military go into Berlin to find her and... while well, Sandman's crew go in and... They survive and... Oh, come on! This mission was set up perfectly. We had all these crazy obstacles thrown at us and we finally get to the end of the level, and how are we rewarded? Oh, you failed again. No payoff or anything for all that was just built up makes this mission very unsatisfying to play. It does set up a fun mission in the next one where Price and Yuri team up with Sandman's crew to rescue both the president and his daughter, but once you get there and finally find the daughter, it's so anticlimactic that it's hardly even addressed and you just rush on past her to find the president. There isn't even anyone guarding her there! Gosh, who's running security here, the Russian Secret Service? I think this is what they call a running gag. The group find the president, but he's taken into a steel bunker. However, they're able to climb on top of the bunker and... The group fight their way out, but Delta Force sacrifices themselves so Price and Yuri can escape with the president. With the president safe, the war ends, but Price has one more call to make. Who's this? Prisoner 627. I'm coming for you, Makarov. Haven't you heard, Price? They say the war is over. My war ends with you. Like it ended for Captain McTavish? Tell me, Price, how long did it take him to die? I've destroyed your world piece by piece. It's only a matter of time until I find you. You won't have to look far. In the final mission of the trilogy, we finally play as Captain Price as him and Yuri assault Makarov's resort in Juggernaut gear. As they make their way through the resort, their armor is destroyed by a chopper, and Yuri is unable to go on. Why do I feel like I've seen this somewhere before? Oh, look at that. I've been impaled. <laughs> Price rushes and finds Makarov as his chopper takes off. Price brings down the helicopter, but it seems Makarov has the upper hand. Goodbye, Captain Price.
And that was Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. Eh? It's definitely the worst of the trilogy, but can you really blame it? The first two games revolutionized the genre, while this one just seems to follow the same beats the first two used while not innovating nearly enough to set itself apart. 90% of what you see in this game you see done better in the first two. It does a good job of continuing and eventually wrapping up the story, but that's really all it does well. If you enjoyed the first two games I would recommend playing it as it does do justice by the characters and the plot, but if you're looking for a standalone experience I think there are plenty of more deserving choices. But remember, there's only one thing worse than the third part of a trilogy. A reboot. Bravo 6. Going dark. Ah, oh, crap. Well, I'm Brandon Satterwhite for iDash Gaming. Thank you for watching.